this this morning as we praise. And come on, why don't y'all clap with us too? Come on. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see?
you and I have freedom. We have joy. We no longer have to live bound by the things of this world, but we can enjoy a new life in Christ. Amen. Jesus is the most powerful name that there has ever been and that there ever will be. The Bible says that it's at the name of Jesus that everything that has a name will bow, which means that cancer, divorce, division, hatred, unforgiveness, bitterness, all things that have a name that want to stand against the name of Jesus will bow before the power of the name of Jesus. So before we continue with today's service, we're just going to ask you guys, as the lights come up, just to look to the person to your right or the person to your left, to tell them good morning 
and you can be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you are all, are all here with us today. Uh, for those of you who I don't know, or if you're new here, I'm Pastor Jordan, the Associate Pastor here at Naples Church. And we just want to welcome you. If you are newer here, please go out to our Welcome Center after service and uh, grab a free gift. Say hi to us. We have some fresh-baked, ooey-gooey Otis Spunkmeyer cookies, which I definitely did not eat one of before service. Uh, no one saw anything. Uh, <laughs> They're delicious. You'll like them. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Uh, for everyone who does call Naples Church home, I just want to take a minute to say thank you to you guys for everything that you do, for giving, for serving, for praying for us. You are the reason why we can do everything that we do. And kind of what's on my, my mind right now specifically is that we are taking a team of 10 people down to Honduras, and we leave on Tuesday. We're going to be down there for a week. Which, yeah, we're very excited for. Uh, but we're able to do that because of you guys. We're able to go down there and just share just the love of Jesus, that he's on their side, believes in them, that there is, there is whatever they need is going to be found in him. And we get to go share that message because of you. And even if you're not on the trip, you're a part of our church and you're a part of what we're doing down there. And so I just want to say thank you to you guys and would like to ask a favor, and that's that during this next week while we're there, if you see one of the posts we put up of what's happening that day, or you're just kind of around, and you, it, the trip pops into your mind, just keep us in your prayers. Pray that God's will is going to be done down there, that while we're ministering, that people's, their hearts will be ready to receive, for God's will to be done, that the things the enemy is trying to do in the country, that that will come to a standstill and the things that God wants to do are going to prevail. And then, of course, pray for us just for, for uh, safety and health for the team because that's always just, that's one of the best things that you can pray for for anyone who's traveling is health and safety. So please do keep us in your prayers over this next week and just thank you for everything you're doing. And when you see the pictures or you hear back from the team and different things that, remember that you're a part of that. Don't think, oh man, I wish I could have been a part of that. You guys are. And so we just thank you for praying for us, for being a part of what the church is doing. We love you all so much. Uh, what I want to do now before we get to our announcements is just take a moment and pray. Invite God into today's service. Invite him into our hearts to do what he wants to. And just as a church, just to say, God, whatever it is you need me to learn today, to make me better, I want to learn it. So please join me in prayer for a moment. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now and we just thank you so much for what you have planned today. Lord, our prayer as a church is that you would move in us, that you would change things in us, that Lord, as we're in your presence and we're attentive to your word, Lord, that we would get better. And so Lord, as a church, we believe just for what you're wanting to do in our community and in the world. And we thank you that you've called us all together and we just believe for great things. Lord, that when we spend time in your presence, that we will never leave the same, but we'll leave better. In Jesus' name, amen. Please watch these announcements. Hey there, Naples Church. Thank you for joining us today. If you're new to the church, our amazing team would love to meet you. Please scan the QR code on a seat near you and visit our Welcome Center after the service for a free gift and some freshly baked cookies. Join us for our upcoming Sunday School class focusing on the Holy Spirit. Prepare to dive into an enlightening study, exploring the role and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This class offers a fantastic opportunity to deepen your understanding and experience the dynamic presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit class will be held on Sunday, June 9th at 12 p.m. Sign up online on the Naples Church app or in the lobby. Join us on Saturday, June 22nd from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. for a special combined Start Here and Growth Track event. This is your chance to fast track your journey and start serving at our church. Childcare is provided for children from birth through fifth grade. This event is the next step for anyone looking to explore their gifts, connect with the church community, or find their place. Operation Shoebox is underway with more ways to get involved than ever before. You can participate by filling a shoebox with gifts, 
making a donation, or contributing bulk items. Shoeboxes are available for pickup and registration in the lobby and are due back next Sunday, June 9th. If you've never been a part of this outreach, we send shoeboxes filled with presents to children in Guatemala who might not otherwise receive any gifts during Christmas. Whether you fill a box yourself or donate, your contribution makes a significant impact. Pick up a box today. Join us tonight at 6 p.m. for our young adult service designed for college students and those in their 20s and 30s. Connect with peers at church over coffee and praise and worship. Exciting things are happening in our young adult ministry, and we'd love for you to be part of it. We are thrilled to have you as a part of the Naples Church community. Check out all of the exciting events we have planned for you by visiting NaplesChurch.com or downloading our church app. Have a great week. EZYC, I was depressed and I was alone. I was mentally cloudy and spiritually hopeless. I was raised in the church and started to walk away from Jesus. I didn't fully grasp the magnitude of Christianity or my relationship with Jesus. I didn't know what I was doing with my future. I was lost, suicidal, and an addict. And after ECYC, I came back with a family. I came home clear-minded and spiritually strengthened. I rededicated my life and was filled with the Holy Spirit. I came back fully convinced and on fire and realized how big and real this is. I want to pursue the medical mission field. I gave my life to Jesus, was set free, and I'm now called to ministry. As you can tell from the testimonies you just saw, events like ECYC play an important role in the spiritual development of our next generation. Last year, thanks to your support and giving hearts, we were able to send many youth to the East Coast Youth Conference who would not have been able to attend otherwise. And this year, we would love to send even more. The cost of this year's conference is $400. If you would like to sponsor a youth or make a donation of any size, please scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you or write in Naples Youth Sponsorship on a tithe envelope and drop it off at a giving box on your way out of service. Thank you so much for your support. All right. So, uh, yeah, you can clap for that. Those are some amazing, amazing, amazing stories and testimonies that we have heard. And that's only, that's only six of them. That's just, that's just a few of them um, of testimonies that we've heard that have come back from the East Coast Youth Conference. It's, it's events like that and like our, um, our annual retreat that really are catalysts for change in the lives of these young youth. Um, so we're, uh, we're coming up to uh, that time of year again where we're going to be taking them to Orlando for four days with a thousand plus other youth from all over the state of Florida to get in the presence of Jesus, to get out of just the norm of what we do here in Naples and to come together as the body of Christ, to come together as this young generation and to see change. And I want to sit for one second on that one testimony, which is so phenomenal, the, the young man where he said, I was lost, I was an addict, and I was suicidal. Uh, two years prior to last year's ECYC, um, he had attempted to take his life and had spent two days in the hospital as they tried to, uh, to save him. And then at ECYC was still addicted, still struggling through things and ended up almost getting arrested at Universal City Walk. Um, and I w I w we were like, we're going to send him home. We're like, you know, it, it's going to cause a massive disruption. And, it, you know, and the Holy Spirit said, no, keep him. Keep him. He needs to stay here. And that night, he gave his life to Jesus. And on that night, everything changed. And we're coming up on a year later, and he is completely free of all substances. He is, um, he has given his life to Jesus. Been filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, here recently received his acceptance to Southeastern University, and is called to ministry and going to be a youth pastor. And 
So it is. It's it's through these moments, this like East Coast Youth Conference. It's not just a con, you know. It's not just a, a concert. It's not just a party for kids. It really is getting in the presence of God. So uh, we just ask um, if if you find it in your hearts to sponsor a youth or to give any amount. It all makes a difference. Last year, I think we sent right around like ten or eleven kids. Uh, we have even more this year that are wanting to go, and it's because of you guys that it's possible to do that. So thank you guys so much for opening up your hearts and supporting this next generation. Thank you, Pastor Brendan. That is, uh, you know, that's just another reason. That's why we do what we do, guys. That's, it's lives changed. It's kids and youth hearing from God, finding out what he has for them, and beginning to pursue that relationship. And uh, so again, just everyone who's a part of the church, who's, who gives and serves for everything you do, thank you guys. That is why we do it. Um, today I'm going to continue with the message we started last week on discovering God. Last week we looked at three things. We looked at that we need to discover God daily, that there's something that he wants to say to us and an aspect about himself and who he is and the life he has for us that we can find out every single day. Uh, we looked at how we need to discover how God changes us, and the idea of how God's described in the Bible as an all-consuming fire, and that what he wants for us is to be close to him and in that fire with him, because that's where he purifies us. That's where we're refined, where the things in us, sometimes that are even really deep inside, they get melted out, so that way we're left with a pure, better version of ourselves. So we looked at how God wants to change us, and then we, we looked at how we need to discover how little we know. That God is so much bigger than anything we can imagine, than the situations that he's helped us with through, even, even up to, to this point now. He's bigger than the biggest thing he's ever done for you. And he can do more than the biggest thing he's ever done for you. And so we're looking at that, and, and the idea that we need to be adventurers with God rather than experts on him. And so we're going to continue with that thought and just as a recap of the difference between an expert and an adventurer is that an expert can look at what God's doing in the fire from a distance without ever having to get close enough to feel the flame. We can look and see how he's moving and what he's doing and what he's said without ever having to be in the fire with him. But what he wants for us is not to be distant observers, but to be walking through life with him side by side, in the flame with him, where in his presence we are better. That we become better spouses and better parents and grandparents and friends and insert any other kind of relationship that you have in your life. He wants us to be better and he has more for us. He just asks that we invite him in and walk with him. So today we're going to look at two more things that God wants us to discover. That if, if we want to live a vibrant, full life with God, we need these two elements. And so the first one is we need to discover how to think. We need to discover how to think, or what the Bible refers to as a renewed mind. Erwin Lutzer said, the difference between worldliness and godliness is a renewed mind. We see in Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So God wants to transform us. He wants to make us better. He has better for us. God has better for you than the best that you have ever had. If right now you think this is the top life can get, everything's going good, you're closer to God than you've ever been before, your family's happy, your job's secure, God has better. And he wants better. And if you're on the opposite end of that, you feel far from God and you have no idea what tomorrow holds and your kids don't like you and, or you don't like your parents because there are some kids in here, however it is, God has better for you than today. But we have to figure out how to get it. And he says he wants to transform us by changing how we think. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks within himself, 
so he is. What we think on the inside affects our outside life. And we have to learn to change that so it lines up with what God's word says. And when we do that, we get to live the kind of life that God has for us. Philip Ryken said, the formation of the heart comes through the transformation of the mind. Therefore, one of the primary ways the Holy Spirit changes the things we love and worship is by changing the way we think. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. I'm going to share something with you that's going to revolutionize your whole life. Um, you've never heard this before. Uh, your emotions and your mind, your heart and your mind will lie to you. I know no one's ever had that thought before. Um, you can't trust them. The Bible says that from your heart comes every kind of evil. Not your neighbor's. It's not, I saw some of you like nudge your spouse. It's like, no, it's yours. It's your heart. From us comes every kind of evil. We can't trust what we feel. And we can't trust what we think. Have you ever heard someone who's really proudly said something like, well, you know, we whoever is, we just get angry. And they're proud of that. It's like, you know us, man, we'll fight on the, We'll fight a drop of a hat. Oh, well, you know us. We just, we're just criers. It's like some people are really proud about the bad things that they think and do. But how we were raised and what the environment we grew up in will lie to us. And how we've, how we've learned to think up until now can be wrong. Can we all, are we all uh, mature enough to admit that we don't know everything? Yes. Okay, if anyone knows everything, stand up. I'd love you to come down and teach us. Um, none of us are. We don't know everything. None of us are smart enough. We all have things that we see wrong. And we've all had moments in our life where someone explains something to us. And sometimes it's something we were really pig-headed about. Like, we knew we were right. And then someone explains it, and we go, oh. You guys ever made that oh? Yeah. All the men are like, yes, I have a wife, I know. It's, 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 I say O oh, all the time. Well, with God, we need to have a lot more O's. Because we need to train our minds how to think. I love this, this quote. It says, he who trusts his own heart is a fool. Just because you feel something, and you might feel it strongly, or it might move you to extreme emotion, doesn't mean it's right. Just because someone's always told you something, you've always thought something some way, that doesn't mean it's right. We have to start taking what God says compared to what we think and comparing them. So jumping back to my previous example, if you're someone who just, well, my dad's been always as was a hothead, my grandpa was, I am, like, that's just kind of how we are. The Bible says to be angry and sin not. So that means that you can have emotion and feel angry and still control your mouth and actions. That's what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that we are in control of our emotions, that we're in control of our thoughts, we're in control of our actions. There's nothing that happens where, oh, well, someone else made me do it. Nope. The Bible puts the blame squarely where it's supposed to be, and that's on us. We have to look at what we think and say and do, but how does that happen? What do we need to do to, in order to change how we think? How do we renew our mind? Well, to that, I have two things I want you to start visualizing in your mind. One is going to be a chair, and whatever's in that chair is what you think on. Now, for most of us, we go through life without thinking about what we're thinking about. It just kind of happens. Something comes up, we go, oh man, I don't know what we're going to do about that. Man, this bill, that's more than I was expecting from that hospital visit. Man, I wonder what's going to happen. How are we going to make that work? I'm going to have to move money from this account. to uh, What card's maxed out? You just think about something, and that's what's sitting in the chair. But what God's asked us to do, as we saw in this verse earlier, is that we're supposed to take our thoughts captive. 
into the obedience of Christ. So we start, instead of just letting whatever that thought is go, we start going, you know what? I'm not going to think about this anymore. And you take that thought out and you choose to replace it with what God's word says. So what does that look like? Say that you say you're dealing with sickness and what the thought has been is, well, I I wonder what that next test is going to be. I hope it's positive. I hope this hasn't spread. I hope it's better than it was before. Oh, they were concerned about something. I hope they don't find anything. Oh, what's that hospital bill going to look like? And we take that thought out and we replace it with Jeremiah 30, 17. For I will restore health to you. I will heal your wounds, says the Lord. What that looks like is, God, I had this test coming up and I really don't know what it's going to say, but you said that you're going to heal my wounds and restore my health. Lord, I know that the doctor said that this is terminal, but you said you're going to restore my health and you're going to heal my wounds. And I don't know what to think about this sickness. It sounds kind of scary. The doctors aren't sure if the treatment's going to work, but you restore my health and heal me. We start to replace it. What if you're afraid? You have some anxiety about what's going on. Isaiah 41.10, do not fear for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you. God, I I really don't know what to do with this situation, but you will help me. You are strengthening me. You are upholding me. What if you need peace? If any of you, I just heard the ding from one of your phones. Some of you just got a news notification. If you made the mistake of pressing yes when it said, do you want to be notified by that news app? You need peace. (laughs) So how do you get it? Isaiah 26, 3, I will keep in perfect peace all who, or you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. You want to know how to have peace in this world? God, I have no idea what's going to happen. It looks like there's a war. There could be a new virus. What's going to happen with the elections? What's going on? There's all these news notifications. Lord, I need peace. So I'm going to trust you. I'm going to keep my thoughts fixed on you. And I know that you're going to bring me peace. Now, here's the thing about when we try to change how we think. Our mind is like a three, is like a toddler, a little three-year-old, who you put in the chair and say, hey, stay there, and then you turn around to go grab something that they asked for, and then you turn back and you're like, where'd they go? <laughs> and so then every, you'll get really quiet for a second, you start listening, like, what room are they in? And then you hear them in the fridge, and you run over, and somehow they've scaled up, they're in the doors, and they're grabbing something you said they shouldn't have, right? It doesn't, they doesn't listen very well initially. So what you have to do is sometimes when you're training your mind is you go, Lord, thank you that you said you're my healer. Man, I wonder what the doctors, no, 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 no. I got to put, put my mind back in the chair. And you got to do that for a little bit because you have to train your mind. Then what ends up happening is as you do that, well, now your mind learns what it's supposed to do and what it's supposed to think about. And it stays in the chair longer. And other things don't get to get into it. But there's, there's, there's two parts to the mind. We have the chair But you also have that other thought that you took out of the chair. Now, that thought is like an unruly teenager. They're kind of a pain. And if you don't, if you just take them out of the chair and let them go anywhere, they're going to come over and kick the toddler out and sit back down with even a worse attitude. So that's where the Bible says you have to take the thought captive. So you have a chair where you decide what you're going to think on, but you also have to take those negative thoughts and bring them over to the supermax. Lock them in put them under guard. Because the Bible says, bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. That's God, I am choosing not to think about this anymore. I'm going to lock that away. And in Jesus' name, that's not going to be my main thought anymore. I'm replacing it. And here's the thing, we can all control our thoughts. Founder of my Bible school said something great. He said, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from building a nest in your hair. You may have a thought that is wrong that you shouldn't have, but you know what? You don't have to just let it sit there and build a home on your head. You can stop and take it away and decide to replace it. And what happens is the more that we replace those thoughts, 
the more that we start to think the way God thinks, our faith grows. Because we start to see what God can do in situations rather than what we can do in our limitedness in the situation or what anyone else can do. We start to see God in things that up until this point we've kept closed. We start to invite him in because until we start to think and say things right, no matter how desperately we want God in a situation, we're essentially keeping our foot on the door so he can't come in. So God's trying to come in, and we're trying to pull it, but our foot is planted firmly, keeping that door shut. And what has to happen is we need to start to change what we're thinking and changing then what we say, and all of a sudden now we're able to open the door to God and bring him in where he brings light and love and health and redemption and restoration into the things in our life that are dead and broken and dying right now. And he makes us better as we invite him in, as we start to line our words and our actions up with what he says. And what happens when, the, when we start to see what God can do is that we discover that anything is possible. We serve a God who can raise the dead. So if God can defeat death, then what in your life is too far gone for him to fix? If God can bring people back to life, then he can bring healing to your body. He can bring restoration to your relationships. He can provide for your family and take care of you. He's big enough. So if the resurrection is possible, everything is possible. John 11, let's just see what happens when Jesus comes into a situation. John 11, Jesus said, take away the stone. This is when Jesus went to see Lazarus who had died. Martha, the sister of the dead man, exclaimed, but Lord, by this time he is decaying and throwing off an offensive odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you and promise you that if you would believe and rely on me, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. Yes, I know you always hear and listen to me. But I've said this on account for the benefit of those standing around, so they know that you sent me. He said, when he said this, he shouted in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And out walked the man who'd been dead. Jesus shows up and says, God's listening. We've got you. And he says, you know those things you have walled off right now that there's dead stuff behind that's decayed and smells and is the worst parts? He says, let's roll away that stone and bring life. When we start to think the way that God has us thinking, we discover everything is possible. That God, who the same God who raised the dead is at work for us. And that's not just wishful thinking. That's a promise I, or Ephesians 1.19, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. The power that raised Christ from the dead performed the ultimate miracle that restored our ability to have a relationship with God, that forgave sin, that brought life back to Jesus' body that pulled him out of hell, defeated sin in the grave, the greatest power and working of God's miracle power is for us. So what do you need God in? What situation has so far you've, has just been controlled by whatever's sitting in the seat that you need God to come into and speak some life into? What do you need God to show up in your life and say, come out, thing that has died? I want to give you one more quote and one final scripture. The gospel, the good news about Jesus' death and resurrection is not merely the power by which dead sinners are raised to life. It is also the power by which God's people are transformed. Jeremiah 32, 17. Alas, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard or too wonderful for you. If you just take that one verse, you can take everything out of the seat. 
God, I don't know what's going to happen with my family. We're fighting, but there's nothing too hard or too wonderful for you. God, I don't know what to do with my, in my health. My body is failing me, but there is nothing too hard or too wonderful for you. God, I haven't talked to this family member in 15 years, but there's nothing too hard or too wonderful for you. I don't know how we're going to pay this bill, but God, there's nothing too hard or too wonderful for you. Take out the things that are in the seat right now and start putting in, there is nothing too hard or too wonderful for you. And as you start to do that, you'll discover that there's nothing that's impossible for God. And so as we get ready to take communion, this is what I want us to focus on. Jesus said when, when, he, when he gave the uh, first communion, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember what I've done for you, what I've taught you, and remember what I'm going to do for you. So if you, if you didn't get the uh, communion elements when you came in, please raise your hand. The ushers will bring those to you if you, uh, if you missed those on your way in. If anyone needs it, just raise your hand. As we get ready to take this, what I want you guys to remember and keep your eyes focused on with this is that what Jesus did on the cross is what made it possible for us to change how we think. It made it possible for us to get better. It made us right with God. And so as we take this, I want you to start to think about the thing in your life that God's been standing outside of saying, if you let me in, I can, I can make this come back to life. If you've never taken communion with us with these, what I'm going to ask you to start by doing is just where the tab is, push that down to a 90 degree angle or so and let go. And the top plastic piece will pop up. Ushers, we have a few more people up at the top over here so you can get to the uh the wafer before we take this what i want you to guys to remember what jesus said he said on the day that he was betrayed he took bread he broke it he said this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me remember the things that the best things that god's done for you so far and remember that that's not where he stops that there is more that the dead things inside can come to life. That just like his broken body was brought back to life, there's nothing too hard or too wonderful for God. So please take the wafer and join me in taking this. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everything you've done for us. I thank you, Lord, that there's nothing too hard or too wonderful for you and that as we remember and we choose to think on you and what your word has said, Lord, I thank you that we will also see impossible and dead things come to life in us also. In Jesus' name, please break and eat. Now you can peel back the second layer from the cup for the juice. Jesus said, this is my blood, representative of a covenant with you. Do this in remembrance of me. A covenant is something for the future. It's a promise going forward, and what he's promised is that when you think the way he says to think and we follow after him, that there's nothing too hard or too wonderful for him. There's no situation that you're in right now that he cannot fix, that he's not willing to fix, that he doesn't want to fix. And so as you drink this, what I want you to remember is a promise going forward that he's not done with you yet. That the things that you've carried up until now are things you don't have to carry into tomorrow. That things that have been one way for the last 20 years don't have to make it to 21 years. That with God, there's nothing too big or too wonderful. Heavenly Father, we choose right now just to set our focus and minds on you. And thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done for the shedding of your blood that covered our sin, that made it possible for us to live the life that you have for us, and to reconnect with you. Lord, what I ask is that as we drink this, that the things in our life that need to come back to life, that they will. That your power will move into areas that so far we haven't let you into. And that as we do this, Lord, that we will be forever changed. In Jesus' name, please drink. Guys, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I said this next week we're going to be down in Honduras, so please keep us in your prayers. 
When you're walking out on the tables, there are some bins you can drop these in. The ushers have them also. Uh, but just be praying for us over this next week. And do, make sure you're here next week for a message from Pastor Maria. You guys are going to love it. Thank you all so much for being here. We'll see you next week.